Julie of the Wolves, bottom of page 191. She thought of Capagoon and hurried on. What would she say to him? Would they rub noses when they met? Surely he would hug his favorite child and let her enter his house, tan his hides, sew his clothes, and cook his food. There was so much she could do for this great hunter now. Prepare caribou, catch rabbits, pluck birds, and even make tools with water and the freezing air. She would be very useful to him, and they would live as they were meant to live, with the cold and the birds and the, and the beasts. She tried to recall Capricorn's face, his dark eyes and the brows that drooped kindly. Would his cheeks still be strong and creased by laughter? Would he have long hair and stand tall? A green fountain of magnetic light shot up into the sky, its edges rimmed with sparks. The air crackled, the river groaned, and Mayax pointed her boots toward Capagoon. She could see the village of Kangik long before she got to it. Its light twinkled in the winter night on the first bench of the river near the sea. When she could make out windows and the dark outlines of houses, she pulled her sled to the second bench over the river and stopped. She needed to think before meeting Capagoon. She pitched her tent and spread out her sleeping skins. Lying on her stomach, she peered down to, on the town. It consisted of about 50 wooden houses. A few were large, but all had the same rectangular design with peaked roof. Kangik was so snowy, she could not see it if there was trash in the streets. But even if there had been, she would not have cared. Kafugun's home had to be beautiful. The village had one crossroad where the church and mission stood. On either side of them were the stores, which Mayax recognized by the many people who wandered in and out. She listened. Dog teams barked from both ends of town, and although she knew they were snowmobiles, the village was essentially a sled dog town, an old-fashioned Eskimo settlement. That pleased her. Her eyes roamed the street. A few children were out, romping in the snow, and she guessed that it was about 10 o'clock in the morning, the time Eskimo children were sent out to play. By that hour, their mothers had completed their morning chores and had time to dress the little ones and send them outside, cold as it was. Below the town, she could see the musk oxen Uma had spoken about. They were circled together near the gate of their enclosure, heads facing out to protect themselves from wolves and bears. Her heart thrilled to see that these wondrous oxen of the north. She could help Capagoon take care of the herd. Two children burst out of a house, put a board across a barrel like a seesaw, and took their position, standing on either end of the board. They began jumping, sending each other higher and higher, and coming down on the board with incredible accuracy. Mayax had seen this game in Barrow, and she watched the flying figures with fascination. Then she slowly lifted her eyes and concentrated on the houses. There were two green houses near the wilderness. She was debating which one was Capagoon's when the door opened and the smaller one and three children tumbled out. She decided he must live in the other one, with the windows, the annex, and the two wooden boats in the yard. A woman came out of Capagoon's house and hurried across the snow. Of course, Mayax thought. He is married. He has someone to sew and cook for him, but I can still help him with the oxen. The woman passed the church and stopped at the mission door. She was engulfed in light for an instant. Then the door closed behind her. Mayax rose. It was time to seek out her father. He would be alone. Her feet skimmed the snow as she ran down the hill and across the road where the children were hitching a dog to a sled. They giggled and turn it answered their high bird-like voices from inside her hood. As Mayax neared the green house, she took turn it into her hand and ran right up to the door. She knocked. Footsteps sounded from a far corner of the house. The door opened and there stood Capigan. He was just as she remembered him, rugged but with dark gentle eyes. Not a word came to her mind, not even his name or a greeting. She was too moved by the sight of him to speak. Then Turnip peeped. She held him out. I have a present for you, she said at last in Eskimo. The feather coat rustled and Turnip's amber head pulled into the covering like a turtle. What is it? Capagoon's voice was resonant and warm and seemed to come from the seashore at Nunavik, where the birds sang and the sea had framed with the fur of its parka. Come in. I've never seen such a bird. He spoke English, and she smiled and shook her head. He repeated his invitation in Yupik. Mayak stepped across the threshold and into his home.
The big room was warm and smelled of skins and fat. Harpoons hung on the wall, and under the window was a long couch of furs. The kayak hung from the ceiling, and a little stove glowed in the center of the room. Capricorn's house in Kangak looked just like Capricorn's house in Seal Camp. She was home. Turnit hopped on the floor, his feather coat blooming beside him, behind him like a courting ptarmigan. He ran under a fur. He wears a coat. Capigone laughed and got down on his knees to peer at the bird. Yes, my ex said. He is the spirit of the birds. He is golden plover. A golden plover, the spirit of the birds? Where did you hear that? Capigone arose and pushed back her parka hood. Who are you? Julie Edwards, my ex Capigone. The great frost blackened hands ran softly over her face. Eli, he whispered. Yes, you are she. You are beautiful like your mother. He opened his arms. She ran into them and for a long time he held her tightly. When they sent you to school, he said softly, none of it was too much to bear. I left and began a new life. Last year, when at last I was rich, I went back to get you. You are gone. His fingers touched, touched her hair and she hugged her and he hugged her once more. The door opened and the woman came in. Who have we here? She asked in English. Mayak saw that her face was pale and her hair was reddish gold. A chill spread over her. What had Capigone done? What had happened to him that he would marry a Gussic? What was his new life? Capigone and his woman talked. She loudly, Capigone quietly. Mayak's eyes went around the room again. This time, she saw not the furs in the kayak, but electric lamps, a radio phonograph, cotton curtains, and through the door to the annex, the edge of an electric stove, a coffee pot, and china dishes. There were bookshelves and a framed picture on the wall of some American country garden. Then she saw a helmet and goggles on the chair. Mayak stared at them until Capigoon noticed her. Ah, that, he said. I now own an airplane, Mayak. It's the only way to hunt today. The seals are scarce and the whales are almost gone, but sportsmen can still hunt from planes. Mayak's heard no more. It could not be. It could not be. She would not let it be. She instantly buried what she was thinking in the shadows of her mind. My axe, the wife said in bad upic, I teach in the school here. We shall enroll you tomorrow. You can learn to read and write English. It's very difficult to live even in this Eskimo town without knowing English. My axe looked at Capigoon. I am on my way to San Francisco, she said softly in upic. The Gussics and, and Wainwright have arranged transportation to me. I shall go tomorrow. A telephone rang. Cavagoon answered it and jotted down a note. I'll be right back, he said to Mayax. I'll be right back, then we'll talk. He hugged her. Mayax stiffened and looked at the helmet. Ellen, fix her some food, he called as, she put, as he put on his coat, a long American-made Arctic field jacket. He zipped it with a flourish and went out the door. Ellen went into the kitchen and Mayax was alone. Slowly, he picked up tur she picked up Turnit, put on her sealskin parka, and placed a little bird in her hood. Then she snapped on the radio, and as it crackled, whined, and picked up music, she opened the door and softly closed it behind her. Capigoon, after all, was dead to her. On the second bench of the river above town, she found her tent and pack, threw them onto her sled, and, bending forward, hauled on it. She walked up the river toward her house. She was an Eskimo, and as an Eskimo, she must live. The hour of the lemming was upon the land, cycling slowly toward the hour of Mayax. She would build snow houses in winter, a sod house in summer. She would carve and sew and trap, and someday there would be a boy like herself. They would raise children who would live with the rhythm of the beasts on the land. The seals are scarce and the whales are almost gone, she heard Capigone say. When are you coming to live with us in San Francisco? called Amy. My ex walked backwards, watching the river valley. When the last light of Kangak disappeared, the stars lit the snow and the cold deepened far below zero. The ice thundered and boomed, roaring like drum beats across the Arctic. Turn it, Pete. My ex turned her head, touched him with her chin, and felt his limpness. She stopped walking and lifted him into the cold. Turn it, what's wrong with you? Are you sick? Swiftly opening her pack, she took out some meat, chewed it to thaw it, and gave it to the bird. He refused to eat. She put him inside her parka and pitched her tent out of the wind. When she had banked it with snow, she lit a small fire. The tent glowed, then warmed. 
Turnit lay in her hands, his head on her fingers. He peeped softly and closed his eyes. Many hours later, she buried him in the snow. The totem of Armrock was in her pocket. She ran, her fingers ran over it, but she did not take it out. She sang to the spirit of Armrock in her best English. The seals are scarce and the whales are almost gone. The spirit of animals are passing away. Armrock, Armrock, you are my adopted father. My feet dance because of you. My eyes see because of you. My mind thinks because of you. And it thinks on this thundering night that the hour of the wolf and the Eskimo is over. Julie pointed her boots toward Capagon.